This is Tom Fox. Welcome to the newest edition in the Compliance Podcast Network. My latest podcast, Compliance and Coronavirus. As the voice of compliance, I wanted to start a podcast which will help bring both clarity and sanity to the field of compliance, the compliance practitioner, and indeed the compliance profession during this worldwide health and healthcare crisis. Taking up a variety of topics as diverse as working from home to sporting events, to the role of the board of directors, to crisis management, to the role of supply chains. We will look at all of these in this podcast. If you have a topic you'd like covered on compliance and coronavirus, please let me know. I'd be happy to do a podcast on it. This week on Innovation and Compliance, I'm running a five-part sponsored podcast series in conversation with K2 Fin Intelligence, navigating an increasingly complex sanctions landscape sponsored by K2 Intelligence Fin. Check out this five-part series with Adam Frey and Eric Lorber. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode, and today I have Ryan Schoenfeld. Ryan is the founder of RAS Consulting, and we're going to explore some of the issues that he is seeing around both due diligence, investigation, and physical security in the era of COVID-19 and the reopening that we're all going through. So, Ryan, first of all, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tom. Ryan, I was wondering if you might be able to uh, tell our listeners what is uh, what led you to found RAS and what's the primary business of the company. Sure, my uh, my background, real quick. I started started in law enforcement. I'm a weird uh, law enforcement guy with a master's in IT, specifically system design and development. So I've always kind of been on the high tech uh, side of crime and investigations. Uh, since then. I've been a consultant for the U.S. State Department, training foreign governments in uh, high-tech crimes and investigations, of course, for for allied nations, Um, and then uh, switched over to the private sector uh, from law enforcement. I ran a book of business for a global security guarding company, and I went in-house and managed global investigations for a fortune company, led global security technology for them. And all of that is what led me up to the founding of our uh, consulting group. Um, and the reason behind it is I found in the physical security world, the industry had just become so antiquated in its approaches uh, and uh how it approached security and investigations and hadn't really evolved with new tools and technologies and and ways to do things. And so uh, RAS Consulting was really born out of uh, frustration with uh, from being an end user. So, Ryan, I wanted to maybe start with what are two or three of the top questions that you and RAS are getting at this point in time around the risk, their company's risk profiles and um questions around not only COVID-19, the reopening, and how to think through that in the midst of an economic dislocation? You know, those those top questions, I would say, kind of evolve about every two weeks right now um, as the the outlook changes. So initially, when uh, COVID was on everybody's radar and shutdowns and um, leaving buildings and working remote was the, the main focus, the questions are really about mass vacancy of buildings. How do we protect our, our buildings and our assets when nobody's going to be there for this unknown period of time, which never happens? Um, what does security look like now for a workforce that's entirely remote that generally we have some type of responsibility for during the workday when they're physically present in the facility? Um, so those were the two main things. And then as COVID started evolving more and it uh, became clear that the, the shelter in place orders were going to last longer, um, companies proactively started looking at, um, even, not, even though they didn't have a date in mind, what is reopening going to look like for the business? In the midst of all that, we had um, two types of companies. One were the ones that were struggling financially and ended up doing uh, mass rounds of layoffs, which presented uh, its own security challenges and investigative challenges looking at uh, workplace violence, hostile terminations, um, and a lot of those things that were, you know, have always happened in businesses, but now we're happening in mass. Um, and then there are companies that were doing really well because of whatever their business 
does um, was thriving in this economy and they're looking to hire folks and they had never experienced hiring remotely and hiring folks that they had never met in person, whether it was executives or um, key employees. And so the, the investigative process for um, those folks uh, due diligence on, on them became that much more critical um, now as people look to reopen, the top questions are, how do we keep our employees safe? Uh, what liability do we have in the workplace when we bring people back? How do we, um, what HIPAA and, and protected health information, uh, is the company now saddled with as we, uh, question people and take temperatures and, uh, you know, do the various things that companies are looking to do as they physically reopen their facilities. Now, let me pick up on one of those points because it's going to be very familiar to uh, compliance practitioners in a wide variety of compliance disciplines and our bribery and corruption, AML, export control, uh, financial crimes, uh, compliance, and that's due diligence and investigative services. One of the things that struck me about the reopening and I suppose COVID-19 as well as is uh, things have changed in the supply chain. You may be looking at suppliers you haven't used. You may be looking at suppliers of products you never had to, uh, such as PPE. You may be looking at uh, new customers and a wide variety of people you do business with. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, as you said, due diligence and investigations have become even more important. Would that be a fair assessment from your perspective? Absolutely. The, the number of, of new vendors and new products that have popped up in the last few weeks is, is really just insane. Um, you know, from thermal temperature detection technologies to companies that sell, uh, masks and, and sanitizers and other PPEs. Um, and people have this, such a sense of desperation that they're, they're buying anything without doing the traditional diligence that they would do to, um, vet a vendor that they were going to have a business relationship with. Um, early on in, uh, the COVID crisis when, um, PPE was such a hot commodity and our, our first line responders weren't able to get the masks that they needed, the market was flooded with fraudulent masks. Um, the government was buying fraudulent masks and giving it to the frontline healthcare workers. Um, and so businesses, the, um, were, spinning up in the PPE space and importing millions and millions of units and dollars of uh, bad product out of other countries um, and selling it with no testing um, or, uh, or validation process. Ryan, one of the things that is on the mind of everyone is working from home, <clears throat> whether that be, as you and I were talking about in the green room, can we connect and stay connected all the way to security, uh, conflicts of interest from perhaps people putting on their own side hustles now to generate an additional income stream. From your perspective, what are you seeing in terms of risk profile changing for your customer base around the issue of working from home? Um, so I, I'd say generally across the board, most of our companies are um, surprised by how efficient uh, their employees have been while working remote and that there wasn't a loss of productivity that was expected. And in many cases, they found people to be more productive. That said, um, most companies were not prepared to have an entirely remote workforce. And so um, putting cybersecurity controls in place to make sure that uh, employees who were accessing sensitive information from home and from inherently insecure locations and, and networks were able to, to do so in a way that wasn't, that isn't putting the, the company at risk. Um, not seeing a huge adoption of technologies to really monitor what the employees are doing and spending their time on. Um, certainly the, the folks in like outbound sales where they have to log a certain number of calls per day, um, you know, it becomes easier to track what they're doing because you can, you can follow all of their activities throughout the, the work day. But for your, um, average employees that, you know, I think there's definitely more side hustles happening, as you said, because people are home and they can, they can do it without detection or, or the folks sitting next to them hearing and seeing what's going on. Um, 
the we're starting to see a slight increase in investigative work related to that um, and related to time card fraud and um, some of those employment type issues, but not a huge uptick. Uh, one of the things that I really was wanted to in- inquire with you about is the issue of physical security, and that's something RAS ha- has provided and continues to provide. As we reopen, or even in a phased reopenings, and, and I'm in Texas, so we're a few weeks perhaps ahead of, of California, but every state has some plan in place to have a phased reopening. What are you seeing around the issue of physical security? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're finding a lot of companies have, uh, hopefully have working groups of cross sections of the organization helping figure out how to properly reopen. Um, early on, what we were seeing is companies saying, Hey, we're going to go out and buy a thermal camera and put it in the lobby and it's going to tell us if somebody has COVID. Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions about the, the use of, of thermals and even the effectiveness of temperature screening. Um, But I think the key takeaway that we want all companies to think about is the holistic approach to um, their physical security program in general, um, and especially in the age of of COVID and, you know, eventually when COVID-19 is gone, whatever the the next one is. Um, You know, this is not an effort that's going to be wasted six months from now. Um, You know, these are things that we can scale up and down as needed. Um, I think the idea of people have always designed physical security as a a perimeter to keep the the bad person out. Um, And so that approach really doesn't change with COVID. It's just that COVID is the bad person. Um, So rather than it being an actual person, how do you keep that? um, uh, How do you keep that disease out of your facility? And the answer is the same as it's always been with security. It's about a layered approach. There's not one piece uh, to the puzzle that's going to solve it for you. Um, So looking at self-reporting tools where employees regularly have to report, uh, you know, maybe even daily before they come into the office, symptoms that they're experiencing or not experiencing, how you coordinate with medical services like telehealth and translating that to prescriptions for uh, COVID testing, how you leverage your physical security infrastructure and IT infrastructure to do contact tracing through the facility um, once there's a, a detection or somebody notifies you that they've tested positive. Your mass communications platform, how do you effectively communicate with large groups of people uh, with consistency of message? Um, you know, that sort of overarching approach to, to how you do it, but also not rushing back before you really need people there. So, Ryan, as we move um, into the reopening and perhaps even to Q3 and Q4, what types of issues are you beginning to raise your clients? And is I was really intrigued by your comments that the kind of questions and advice you were giving changed every two weeks. And that's been the constant literally since, you know, mid-February is change. Is there something that uh, as we move into a a more open economy and perhaps another phase or another uh, uptick in uh, COVID-19 that you're helping people work through some of those issues? You know, I was I was introduced on a call this week as a an expert in COVID nineteen and and reopening of facilities and and the concept of that seemed pretty stupid to me because, you know, how, how can somebody truly be an expert in something that's been around for for weeks? Um, and so I, I I equated a little bit almost to like our work in the um, cannabis industry early on um, when states started adopting uh, legalized cannabis. And very quickly, people started saying, hey, you know, RAS is an expert in, in cannabis security. And we're like, great, it's new, it's new for everybody. Um, so I think being, being nimble and flexible, constantly researching and, and staying on top of um, topics as they come out, there's co- conflicting information, um, certainly understanding the, the sources of information and, and where that's coming from. Um, but I think the... The message to customers at this point is is pretty clear, and I don't see it changing over the next several weeks about um, you know layers, the holistic approach, um, you know that there's there's not a one size fits all um, 
you know, the temperature screening doesn't help with any of your, your asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, not confusing the messaging that came out of the, the World Health Organization this week. Um, and then really just communication is really going to be the key to success for, for any organization right now. Ron, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but I was wondering if uh, listeners wanted more information on, on RIS or some of the topics that we've discussed in this podcast. Where can they go? So I keep my LinkedIn pretty updated with um, new new information as it comes out. Uh, our website is rassecuritygroup.com, um, and uh, my email is ryan at rassecuritygroup.com, so feel free to to reach out and engage in a discussion. Ryan, I really appreciate you visiting with me. And as we move uh, forward, I will ho- perhaps hope I can uh, call upon you again to uh, see where uh, your security world might be and the advice you might have uh, in the fall or, or perhaps later in the year. For sure. Looking forward to it. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance and Coronavirus. This podcast posts three times a week at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of each week. That's 10 a.m. Central Time. I hope you will check out our episodes as we post during this health crisis and economic dislocation. This month on The Compliance Life, I'm featuring Ryan Robillet, who talks about his journey to the CCO chair.